All right, so I have finished my line art. And of course, there are little things I could probably still fix. Like these, there's a little overshoot there. So I use my small selection tool. And then I use my pencil tool and I draw through the anchor and I end through the anchor so it redraws that line. And then here, this connection, I'm going to overlap these so there's not a gap because it's nice for everything to be fully contained once we start coloring. And now I'm pretty good. Now I separated it into just the manticore and then the guy on the back. And I can save these as individual EPS files, or if I turn them both on, I can save it as one EPS file that has them combined. So first, I'm going to save this as my AI file. I'm going to save it to the Creative Cloud. I haven't saved anything there since my uh, logo. Then I'm going to say save as. I'm going to save it onto my computer as an AI file. This is my working file format. So I'm updating it because vectors are always perfectly clean. Right? And now I'm going to save it as, to my computer, a format that will transfer into Photoshop, which is an EPS file. And just to show you everything that's required for, or that you can do with the vector, I'll also say file, save as, onto my computer, an SVG file, which is another type of portable vector format, an older type. Now if I close it, I don't need Illustrator anymore. I can open up Photoshop. And just like we did with our logos before we printed them, we need to make a canvas big enough for our spot illustration. Now with our logos, we did 8 by 10 by 350 for our spot illustration because we're going to be doing text with them and then turning them into posters that can be printed up to 16 by 20. I'm going to do it at 11 by 14 inches at 350 pixels per inch. So I create a new file. Then I drag and drop the EPS file into it. So here is my EPS file. And you'll see it comes in and then I can hold down Option and scale it, make it pretty big on that 11 by 14. If yours is wider than it is tall, you can make it 14 by 11. And this is now a smart object, which means that it's going to scale just like our logo did to whatever uh, raster format it's brought into. So at any time, I can Command T and transform this, make it bigger, and it will always be perfectly clean. So this is what you need to color. You need a Photoshop file that's 11 by 14 by 350 pixels per inch, and you need a smart object. I'm going to mark this as purple. Actually, I'll mark it as gray of your line art. Then I'm going to lock the line art. And I'm going to rename the white background as blank white just by double-clicking on it. And by renaming it, that allows me to lock it as well. Because there's a, a certain order to how you color. There's a certain order to the layers for digital coloring. This is the white bread. This is the, the dark bread. Right? Like a German like deep rye bread. So we have black bread and white bread. This is the digital coloring sandwich. All the color has to go in between. So, what's the most basic sandwich? Like a peanut butter sandwich? Ham and cheese. Ham and cheese. So ham and cheese is two elements, right? What's more important if you had to choose one? Maybe grilled cheese, just the cheese. Because just like a sandwich, you can make it more and more complicated. But we're going to start with the basic. So the basic is to add cheese between our bread. So I'm going to make a new layer that's in between the blank white and the, and the black line art. And this is going to be called local flat color, right? 
Now, another term for this that's not local is just called flatting, F-L-A-T-T-I-N-G. So you want it to be called flatting or local flat color? Let me explain the difference. So it's good to know the difference, but this would be your first step in digital coloring. It's just uh, how complex you want your coloring to be. So if you go to the home page of the, of the class and you go to assignments, this is where all that kind of supplemental stuff is, and you scroll down to assignment five, you'll see all of these links to different slides. The very first one is one that's also in the assignment. You click on that, this will explain everything you need to know about digital coloring. It's a really good reference, really good for studying for the final, really good for looking at later in your life when you need a refresher. So digital coloring always goes behind line art, right? That's the definition, coloring behind a real or implied line. <laughs> coloring behind real or implied line art. These are some handouts. We have those also under links in the Canvas course. And this is the step. Once you've done your line art, then we can do flat color underneath. Flat local color means you fill it with the color that the thing is, despite the lighting conditions. So if the bird is blue and green, then you fill it with blues and greens for local flat color. Flatting is the more professional way of doing it. And it means you just fill it with these crazy colors that are as different from each other as possible. So flatting uses kind of whatever colors just to fill in the different shapes so that they're easily easy to select later and replace with local flat color. Why is it sometimes better to do flatting instead of local flat color? Well, look how similar a lot of these colors are. But if you flat it first, then it gives you the full options to easily change these as you go. Here's another example. Dave Stewart, who's my favorite digital colorist. This is how he flats. And then this is how it gets finished off and modified. Right? So it's how complicated is your sandwich going to be? So these are the flats, the flats behind the line art, the finished line art. Things that were blue and purple have turned to like subtle grays, right? But this allows him to select those shapes easily and modify that color. But I, I'm going to do what Dave Stewart did. Basically really saturated versions of the thing I think it might be at the end. But it always allows me to change it later. And I'm going to try to make each flat color pretty distinct from any other flat color. So, I do this in Photoshop. How do I choose my colors? Well... My favorite way is to actually just steal colors from an existing color palette that you like. It could even be, honestly, this color palette, which is the way that illustrations were first colored in the 21st century. These were the only colors available. You know, mixing on newsprint with cyan, magenta, and black. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. These were the formulas. So all early comic books, these were the only colors you had on kind of a, a brownish tan paper, right? So it was a pretty limited color range, but it has kind of this vintage look, which can be cool. So I took these screen grabs, and you can get color inspiration from anything. I could also grab color inspiration from this. I could grab color inspiration from this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into Photoshop. So here's Dave Stewart. I'm just going to push this up and into the corner. Pretty small. Hit return. Here's this color palette that's right from our slides. I'm going to push it into the lower right-hand corner. Pretty small. If I want to bring in something a little bit more contemporary, here's this illustrator's work. I kind of like it because they're colors I don't usually use. I don't use a lot of pinks and purples, and I don't use greenish yellows almost ever but it's good to be kind of pushed out of your comfort zone. So now I'm going to take all of those. I'm going to merge them together, Command E, and I'm just going to call this color reference. And what it allows me to do, because it's open in Photoshop, is it allows me to steal those colors directly. 
using something called the eyedropper tool, which is right here. Now, I need a place to put them that's not just my color reference. So I'm going to make a new layer, and this is going to be my cheese and my sandwich. And I'm just going to call this flat color. It would be a local color if it's the color the thing actually is. Like Charlie Brown's shirt is yellow. That's local color is yellow. But I don't know yet what the color is of like the mane of my manticore creature. But this is how I can start it. I'm going to start just stealing from these colors. And I want the mane of my manticore to be this color. That one right there. So I use the eyedropper. I select it. It goes into my foreground colors. Then I'm going to use my magic wand with contiguous checked. I'm going to go to my locked gray layer, which is my vector line art. And I'm going to use that magic wand. Doesn't really matter what the tolerance is, but the default is 32, so I'll keep it there. And I'm going to click on the empty space, right? Because even though it's a locked layer, it won't let me paint on it, won't let me rasterize it, it will allow me to select from it. And I'll select that empty space within the main with my magic wand. Then I'm going to move to my flat color layer, and it's going to be the only one I leave unlocked. And then I can use my paint bucket and drop that color in. So now we have cheese on our sandwich. So what is the sandwich? The sandwich is black bread on top, which is the line art cheese, which is going to be the flat color, and then white bread on the bottom. Then I have my references where I can steal colors from. Now, in terms of flatting, every, every shape that is fully contained is going to be a different color. So even though this is also part of the main, I'm going to use my magic wand, go to this layer, select it, go to my flat color layer, use the eyedropper, and I'm going to choose this darker brown color, and then go to the paint bucket, drop it in. Now, because it's flatted, that's a different color than this. That allows me to select it easily. Right? What about the inside? I want this to be lighter than these colors. And maybe I want this in more places than just one. So I'm going to select it from the vector line art. I'm going to hold down Shift, and select it also here, and also here, <laughs> anywhere I think I might want that same color. Also here, also here, also here, also here. Remember, I'm selecting on the empty space inside the lines. I don't want to accidentally select on the black line. I can also select it here. The great thing about using contained vector line art is that my flat color will always have some nice space in between it anyway. Okay, now I've selected multiple shapes. You see all those shapes? And now with the paint bucket, instead of having to take time to go to the eyedropper, I can just hold down option when I'm on the paint bucket and it will automatically select the eyedropper. And then I can just pick a color and then I can drop it in on my flat color layer and it will fill every shape that's touching. Okay. Then deselect. And that might not look like a very different color, but it is a different color, right? But it can also so easily be modified. So if I want to change it, now that I've already flatted it, I can easily click any one of these and change their color. What about the inside of the mouth? How about the tongue? You know, so this is the phase of the project I call kill whitey because we're trying to get rid of all this white space. Even things that we want to be colored white, like the teeth, we want to choose a color white for it. And then we start coloring. And it can take some time. It depends how complex your image is. You just want to make sure to lock all your layers except for your cheese layer, right? Because this is your, your basic coloring. And after this, you might be done. Flat color is a really satisfying way to color. It's always how you start digital coloring. I'll save my work, and I'm going to save it with my name. Because this is a full color spot illustration.